to our service. It's great to be with you. I hope you're keeping well and for those of you who are able to take a break after Easter, I hope you're feeling more refreshed and rested. Our theme today is Enduring Word 
And after Nathan has led us in worship, David will be speaking from 1 Peter 1 and 2. And that wonderful truth that the Word of God endures forever. And we very much look forward to that. I love the fact that God speaks to us through his word and he continually speaks to us through his voice as we listen to him day by day. And I want to encourage each one of us, even now, as we come into his presence and worship our living God, to open our hearts and our inner ears to his voice. In Psalm 95, the psalmist begins with that call, that invitation to worship. Oh come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God. And then he goes on to say, today if you hear his voice. You see, there's always the invitation for us to hear the voice of God. Whatever we're doing, wherever we are, and especially when we draw near in worship. God wants us to know him as we praise him. He delights in us when we listen to him as we worship him. And I bless you to know him more deeply as you tune into his voice more intently. And as you lift your praise for our Lord is the great God, the King above all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this new day. We thank you for your love and your mercies. We thank you for your presence with us. And as we lift our hearts to you, Father, come and speak to our hearts that we would hear your voice today and celebrate that you, Jesus, are the risen Lord. Hallelujah. And that you are alive today and we worship you with all our hearts. Amen. Let's worship. Eternity, free now forever. You pick me up, turn me around. You set my feet on solid ground. Yours now forever, and nothing's gonna hold me back. And nothing's gonna hold me back. Nothing's gonna hold me back. Oh, nothing's gonna hold. your throne to claim this crown through Christ my own yours now forever yeah now nothing's gonna hold me back nothing's gonna hold me back nothing's gonna hold me
Saved a wretch like me For I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind but now I see Hallelujah 
Christ has risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ has risen from the grave. Amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. From the grave The prodigal is welcome home The prodigal is welcome home The sinner now is saved For the God who died came back to life And everything was changed Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Oh death where is your sting Oh fear where is your power The mighty King of kings
through tears of joy I lift my voice in everlasting praise Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Hallelujah Christ is risen from Lift your voices at home Oh death where is your in our hearts hallelujah Christ is risen from the dead Jesus you are alive you are with us now when we worship and bow before you hallelujah Christ is risen from the dead you know, I love the accounts in the Gospels when the disciples meet the risen Jesus there's such excitement joy. When Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room and they were locked up and, they, and it says they saw the Lord, they were overjoyed. When the two disciples were walking to Emmaus, unknowingly speaking to Jesus and they invited him into their homes and he broke the bread, their hearts were burning. When Jesus was standing on the shoreline of Lake Galilee and the disciples saw him from the boat. Peter was so excited that he jumped into the water. He could not get to Jesus fast enough. What we see is joyful and burning hearts. And that's what it should be for us when we encounter Jesus, when we invite Jesus into our hearts and into our lives. When we know that Jesus is with us as he is with us now. And I just bless you right now to know that deep joy within you. The joy of knowing the risen Jesus. And to allow the Holy Spirit to come and flood into your hearts and into your bodies. Burning with that excitement that Jesus is alive, that he's with us. Come Holy Spirit. We welcome your presence. Just let him come right now. Invite him in. Let him come and be with you and speak to you and fill your hearts to overflowing joy. As you know him, Christ is risen from the dead. We welcome your Holy Spirit. Come. Burn in our hearts that we would burn for you and share you with those around us. Come Lord Jesus, burn in our hearts that we would shine for you, that your light in us would radiate around us to those that we work with and we spend our time with. 
fill us with your love, that we would love those around us and share the good news that you invite us to do that, to go and tell that Jesus is alive, that he's risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Just take a moment, let the Holy Spirit come and minister to your hearts. Where there is fear and doubts, Holy Spirit, would you come and just cleanse us from that right now and fill us with that joy and that burning passion that comes from only knowing you and knowing that you are with us and knowing that you are alive. Father, would you increase faith in us that we would walk with you in faith and obedience. Come Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Just let him come. Let him fill you. If you sense his presence, rejoice. If you don't feel anything, rejoice. He is here with you. His presence is with you as you invite him to come. And as you receive, give thanks in your hearts for the incredible love that Jesus has for you. He has for me. That he went to the cross and he rose again. That we might live in freedom and declare freely, Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Our Bible reading this morning is from 1 Peter 1, beginning at verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So, uh, sometimes when we read a passage of scripture, there is a phrase or sentence that pops out at us. Now this happened to me when these verses I have just read, and it is the last sentence. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now I hope that is a reality in your life, as it certainly is in mine. Therefore, I want to concentrate on just these 10 words this morning. I want to start, however, by putting this letter by Peter into context. You know, whenever I read a book in the Bible, I always start with questions. Who wrote this book? Why did they write it? Who was it to and intended for? What period was it written in? What were the issues and problems of the day that it addressed, etc., etc.? Now you may think that the Bible runs chronologically, but it doesn't. Yes, it starts with the creation of the world in Genesis, the first book, and closes with the end times in the last book in Revelation. However, the books in between are not necessarily in chronological order. And even in some of the books themselves, there are huge periods covered, which are not always evident as we read. Now, if you have a study Bible, it is always a good thing to look at the notes at the beginning of the book to familiarise yourself with the answers to the questions I ask. This letter by Peter was meant not for one particular church, but to be forwarded on to churches and believers wherever they may be. Jesus was no longer physically on earth. He had been crucified, risen, and now seated with the Father in heaven. 
The early believers often felt they were aliens and strangers on earth as Christians' teachings set them apart from the world. This letter, written by Peter, was mainly for the Gentile believers, and his letter was one of encouragement to them to keep the faith in the face of persecution they faced on a daily basis, even the possibility of being imprisoned or even put to death. He says to them, you have been born again, you have tasted that the Lord is good. Do not throw away what you have attained. Do not fall back into the ways of the world. Stand firm in your faith. Now this letter could so easily be written to us today. We are unlikely to be imprisoned or put to death for our faith in the West, but persecution comes in many forms. And you may have noticed over the years People can become vehemently opposed to Christians and their beliefs. Christians can be victimised in the workplace and often shunned by work colleagues. Even in families, the same things can happen. We can ourselves feel like aliens in a foreign land sometimes. Not fitting in with the rest of society and many believing we are not quite mentally sound. Just like the believers that Peter is addressing in this letter, we too must remember that we are changed, we have been born again, and that we have all tasted that the Lord is good. There are many testimonies I could tell you of saints who have endured tremendous hardships in their lives, but would testify to the goodness of God. This is just one that I've picked out from many. Alan Gardner was one of God's faithful missionaries. During his lifetime, he experienced many physical difficulties and hardships throughout his service to his Saviour. Despite his troubles, he said, while God gives me strength, failure will not daunt me. In 1851, at the age of 57, he died of disease and starvation while serving on Picton Island at the southern tip of South America. When his body was found, his diary lay nearby. It bore the record of hunger, thirst, wounds and loneliness. The last entry in his little book showed the struggle of his shaking hand as he tried to write legibly. It read, I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. Now why is it that so many saints who have suffered hardship, sorrow, loneliness and cruelty to the point of death can utter those words, I have tasted that the Lord is good? Well, I think it is summarised in these verses from John 3.16 that we all know so well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. It is through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus that we can truly say that the Lord is good. It is the realisation of every saint that whatever trials, temptations, hardships and sorrows we have been through, nothing Nothing compares with what Jesus has done for each of us. The Bible from the beginning to end is a love story, the greatest love story ever told. At the heart of the story is Jesus, God's Son, sent down to earth to show us the way. Such love does God have for mankind that he was prepared to sacrifice his one and only Son on a cross to atone for our sins. He allowed Jesus to endure flogging, cursing and the most horrific death imaginable, a man who was without blemish, perfect in every way. The wrath of God was satisfied with the suffering and death of Jesus. The curse against sin was fully absorbed and the price of forgiveness was totally paid. It was Jesus' resurrection, however, that gave the victory. Without Jesus being raised from the dead, we would still be wallowing in our sins. Death had no hold on Jesus, and it no longer has any hold on those who believe and trust in Jesus. 
you know, whenever I think of the cross and the death and resurrection of Jesus, I realise it has to do with me personally. I must make it personal, otherwise it has no meaning. It is my sin that cuts me off from God. I am the one responsible for my actions and all I can do is plead for mercy. In Matthew 20, 28, it says, the Son of Man came not to serve, but to give his life as a ransom for many. I often ask myself if I am one of the many, but then I'm comforted and assured by the verse in John 1, 12. To all who receive him, believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. My heart is comforted and I embrace the beauty and deity of Jesus. My hope and assurance there then flows in my heart, this great reality, the love of Christ for me. There are many people who feel that being good is enough to get them to heaven. That is a folly. Even our good deeds are defective because so often we do not honour God in the way we do them. Secondly, this is not the way God saves us. He does not weigh the good deeds against the bad. There is no salvation by balancing records. There is only salvation by cancelling records. The record of our bad deeds, along with the penalties they justify, deserves are, are blotted out, not balanced. Of course, not everybody agrees that God is good, and his goodness is called into question each and every day. God's goodness was attacked at the beginning of creation when the serpent implied to Eve that God was not good for not allowing her to taste the fruit of the forbidden tree. Since that time, people have been challenging God's goodness ever since. How can a God allow evil to exist in the world? How can he permit disease, pain, suffering, poverty, hunger, greed, etc., etc.? He can't be very good to allow this to happen. <clears throat> or he doesn't have the power to stop it, many people say. For us, it is difficult to understand how God allows these human tragedies to happen, and we may never fully understand. God tells us in Isaiah 55, eight to nine, that his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Therefore, we cannot expect to understand everything. One thing we do know, however, is that God is not the author of sin. We also know that God, when he created man, gave them a free will. And the first man, Adam, chose sin rather than life. And that has affected all of God's creation to this very day. What we come to realise when we have a personal relationship with God is that he is everything. And everything that God should be he is the sum total of all perfection. There are no defects or contradictions in him, and nothing can be added to his nature to make him better. He possesses every desirable quality, and therefore he is priceless beyond measure, and we can rightly say, God is good. We see the goodness of God in his attributes. For example, when he gives of himself unconditionally and sacrificially, it is love. When he shows favour to the guilty and undeserving, it is grace. When he reaches out to relieve the miserable, distressed and lost, it is mercy. And when he shows patience towards those who deserve punishment, it is long-suffering. When he reveals to us the way things are, it is truth. And when he bears our sins and frees us from our guilt, it is forgiveness. When the Bible says that God is good, it encapsulates all these qualities and more. There are some who would believe becoming a Christian would mean taking the fun out of their lives. Now, I probably was in that camp at one stage. We looked on it that there would be a lot of rules and a lot of things that were no longer permissible and some of those things we enjoyed. However, I discovered the truth is far different. Now, if any of you play sport or have played sport, you will know that there are rules for every game. For instance, if you play tennis, 
What is the point of the game if there are no boundaries to the court, if there isn't a net at the right height and a scoring system that we understand? If you like football, what is the point if the pitch does not have boundaries, or there are no football posts, or a referee who doesn't know the rules of the game? The same reply applies for any sport. The truth is, we only get enjoyment when there are rules which we understand and play by. God's rules and purposes for our lives are to give us fullness of life. The things that he asks us not to do are for our benefit and not to take away our enjoyment. I can safely say that I have more joy and more contentment in my heart than I ever did in my old life. His rules are not difficult to abide by if we keep our eyes, our hearts and our minds focused on him and do not allow the temptations of the world to deflect us. The Bible is called the good news for a reason. It is a promise from God that when we are born again, not from perishable but imperishable seed as Peter puts it, the promise is that this life on earth is not the end but only the beginning. God promises us eternal life. Now there's that great Charles Wesley hymn, which I know you will all know, so often sung at Easter, Christ the Lord is risen today, which has these words. Lives again our glorious King, where, O death, is now thy sting? Dying once he all doth save, where thy victory, O grave? For many people, they believe that this life is all that there is. But as Christians, we know that isn't true. The longing of the human heart is to live and be happy. God has made us that way. He has set eternity into the hearts of men. It says that in Ecclesiastical 3.11, we are created in God's image and God loves life and lives forever. We were made to live forever. And all those who have accepted Jesus Christ into their hearts and know that he is the Son of God will live forever with him in heaven for eternity. We have that promise that we will be changed so that we are capable of experiencing dimensions of happiness that are inconceivable to us in this life. All of God's promises can be found in God's enduring word. All that I've spoken about can be found in this precious book. The word of God is life to all who take it into their hearts. Meditate on it day and night. Live by it. And when we do, we can all be assured by the promises of God. Amen. So let's just take a moment to just pray. And just reflect on what I've been saying. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's just take a moment to remember those times when we have known the goodness of God. We know that he is good when we remember what he has done in each of our lives. We remember his love, mercy and grace and his character. And as we remember, meditate on those truths revealed to us through the living and abiding word of God. So let's just take a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today and forever. We thank you that you are with us each minute of every day in the good times and bad. You encourage us in our walk of faith. You console us in our times of sorrow. And you forgive us when we lose sight of you and step off the path that leads to life. As we remember your goodness, May we, your people, be a people of praise. May our hearts be filled with adoration when we lift our eyes to you. For you are the Lord of all creation. You make all things new. In you we find hope and reassurance because your words are full of truth. We bow down and confess that you are our hope and Lord in our lives. And we worship 
and praise you. Amen. Well, thank you, David, for that great word. And as we draw this service to a close, I want to thank you for being with us, bless you to go deeper into God's word and to enjoy his presence. And let me pray God's blessing over you and your household. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and for always. Amen. Well, God bless you. We look forward to seeing you soon. Have a good week. Bye for now.